Okay, this video is about ARG and we're going to focus on the first part of ARG which is the acceptability part and we're going to be then talking a little bit about doing A evaluation and rationale but not kind of demonstrating it. That's going to be in a later video. So today in this video I'm going to talk about kind of the, the concept or the idea of A evaluation and the kinds of questions that we're supposed to be asking of ourselves and the argument to evaluate A. And so we're going to be talking about acceptability rather than doing acceptability evaluation on any particular arguments. So we're going to, it's going to be abstract. Um, but soon, you'll see just a few uh, items down in this module, we're going to be doing a walkthrough video where I actually demonstrate and do so that you can follow along and do uh, A evaluation on your own listicles. So this video on the A, then there's going to be a quiz testing you on some of these abstract things, but on um, actual examples. Then there's going to be an R video and then another quiz kind of testing you on examples of R to see if you kind of get what's going on. Then the same thing for G. And then after you've got all those under your belt, then a walkthrough video to help you kind of warm up to doing all of those things on your own with the listicle that I assigned you earlier that you've already mapped. Okay, so the key here is to try and wrap your head around the concept. What, did it, what are we trying to do? What's the aim here with evaluating acceptability? And then don't worry so much about how we're actually going to precisely go about doing that in rationale with your listicle because we're going to cover that later. Okay, so just to remind you, you've seen this again, but uh, maybe not with this big pale arrow up here, right? Um, when you did your listicle mapping, that was the argument analysis. That was just to kind of show you the basic ropes for how to map out the logical structure of an argument with a really simple and childish dumb argument. We're going to do the same sort of thing now, but with kind of the second part of critical thinking, which is evaluating the quality of the thing that you just kind of broke apart and, and laid all the pieces out. Right. So that's what we're going to do right now is judging how good that is, how rationally persuasive an argument is or isn't. And so the thing that we need to focus on, uh, this also should be familiar from an earlier video, right, is that we're trying to assess what whether an argument is good or not. And we're going to what what we're trying to do here is be really kind of precise and systematic about what we mean by good because we usually have a pretty fuzzy idea of what good means. Good means, well, I just, I just like the conclusion. I agree with that argument. Um, what we're trying to do in this sequence here and in this course, one of the prime goals of the course is to try and really refine how you think of what good means in the context of arguments such that you can really art articulate to yourself and other people um, why a particular argument is good and ought to persuade them or what the flaws are in a particular argument and maybe help you find uh, things to fix those flaws to turn a bad or deficient argument into a good one. And so again to remind you, right, good arguments have three different components and they have to be good in all three to count as a good argument. Okay, so we're kind of breaking down one big job, which is evaluation of the goodness of an argument or the cogency of the argument into three parts. And so we're going to do each one separately, it makes the task more manageable when you break it up into pieces. And that this way, you don't get distracted, you know that you have these three items to do, you can do each one, make sure that you do all three well, and you don't skip one or forget one because you get distracted by something else. And so we're going to focus on the first thing here, acceptability of foundational claims. So I'm just going to remind you of the visual aid that I kind of gave you, right, about a good conclusion that's supported by a good argument and, and what that kind of looks like, right, is you have to start with acceptable facts or claims that are uncontroversial that form a good foundation. And from there, you want to build up 
to that conclusion with lines of support that are relevant and that don't head off and, and are true but not relevant to the thing. And you need to have enough of those supports to hold up the conclusion even in the face of objections or cons to your pros. Right? So what we're going to focus on here, and I've got, this is a, just a, a, an argument, a sample example argument from rationale. So I've just kind of built an argument in rationale here quickly. And where, where this stuff shows up in rationale, that's what we're going to start learning here. So I want to kind of connect those abstract things to, even though we're not going to be working in rationale right now, I'm just going to show you that acceptability, because in that previous image, right, we start with acceptable facts and claims as our bedrock. Where's the bedrock in a, in a rationale claim? Where are the starting points, the starting places that you want to be uncontroversial and acceptable to your audience? They're the lowest down things, the tips or the roots of your argument. Those are the places where we need to evaluate acceptability. We need to make sure that those starting places, those starting points, those initial um, places where we say things that don't themselves have additional reasons to support them, those things need to be acceptable to us, to our audience on their own because they don't have any backup, right? So we need to look at the bottom, the, the bottom boxes, the ends of chains or branches. Every one of those has to, we have to look at them, think about them and ensure that, yep, this is acceptable. Okay, and then the other two aspects, which we will deal with later, right? The relevance, making sure that those lines of support actually point towards our conclusion in rationale. That means evaluating those links, those lines, those connectors between the different boxes to see if those are actually legit, to see if those lines which allege a connection between one claim and another one actually are there and are strong and can kind of hold the weight of the whole pyramid up. Right? That's R. And then when we get to G, you're going to see that G is kind of a more holistic evaluation of a different um, aspect of the argument, which is you take the argument as a whole, you look at the main branches, and you weigh them against each other. In this particular example, I have one branch that's green, and so it's a supporting branch. And the other one starts with a red box. That's an objection box. So that's like a con or a reason not to believe the conclusion. And when we look at G, we're not going to just be counting up branches, right? So this, you might think, well, this argument's a tie, right? No, not necessarily, because one or other of these branches might be more important, more consequential, something like that. So it's not just about quantity of reasons that you have on your side or that the other ha side has, if there are only two sides to an argument, right? Um, it's about the quality uh, of those particular branches, too. We'll be looking at that when we do G evaluation. But right now we're looking at acceptability, which is the first step. Now, we would all like for the things that we believe and every, every single step of our argument, every claim that we use in our argument as a reason, we would like for all of those to be true. There's a reason why the, the, uh, the mnemonic for this three-step evaluation of an argument is ARG and not TRG. Well, okay, there's two reasons. One is that ARG is, you know, a, a nice mnemonic in that it's the first three letters of argument and TRG would just like screw that up. But the, the more important and consequential reason why it's not TRG, why we're not talking about truth is because you're talking to a philosopher and philosophers know that truth is a super complicated and difficult subject. And that that's going to kind of like be a tangent that's going to distract us. We do not want to open the big can of worms, which is what is truth? Not with a philosopher in the room. Okay. Um, but more practically speaking, right? Uh, you can get into endless arguments with people about what really is truth, how, how you determine it, all those kinds of things, right? Because it's a really, it's a metaphysical topic, right? But what we're interested in here is practical reasoning, right? We're interested in critical thinking that's applicable in the real world. You do not want to get sidetracked. Trust the philosopher on this. You do not want to get sidetracked by philosophical topics when you're trying to think carefully about some real world thing with real world consequences. That is not the time to be talking about epistemology, okay? 
So the reason we talk about acceptability rather than truth is because what we're trying to do is come to a consensus with the other people, the other thinkers that are involved in, in what we're thinking about. Or if we're just thinking about something ourselves, we want to get some consensus with ourselves, right? We want to feel comfortable with the starting points of our argument and that those are, at least to some degree, just not controversial, okay? We don't have to hold the starting points of our arguments up to such an impressively high standard as capital T truth, not for the vast majority of purposes, right? So we just need to look for acceptable. What kinds of claims are we willing, given the stakes of a particular argument, to accept, right? So if we're talking about, you know, uh, somebody's trying to convince you um, of a particular restaurant to go to, right? And so you're just talking about how this restaurant has this cuisine and has these good reviews and things like that. I mean, it's not going to usually affect your life very profoundly. So you're willing to accept particular claims made without really exhaustively and strenuously checking them out. But if you're going in for a medical procedure, you probably aren't gonna be holding the claims that friends make or that even doctors make to that same kind of relaxed standard as you are to, to movie reviews and people's opinions of the quality of the food at a particular restaurant, right? You're gonna have higher standards because it matters more because the consequences of accepting something that turns out not to be true are gonna be a lot greater, right? And so that's where I have this quote, Carl Sagan, it was, he's, I'm old, so he's uh, like my generation's Neil deGrasse Tyson. In fact, Neil deGrasse Tyson was a student of his, and Carl Sagan was the guy who produced the original TV series, Cosmos. So he was a science communicator like Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is shamelessly following in that guy's footsteps. Um, but one of the things that he said, and I like the quote, so I put it up here, is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And what that means is the kind of the more important and unusual a particular claim is, the higher the bar you're going to require the evidence for it to pass, right? Or the more impressive the credentials of the person saying it are going to have to be or something like that. You're going to have higher standards. Uh, something's going to have to um, meet more strenuous uh, criteria before you accept something unusual or unlikely or implausible. Um, rather than something that, you know, you already come to the discussion comfortable with accepting in other contexts, right? So when we're determining acceptability of a particular claim, we're doing something different than asking for reasons why that thing is true, okay? So I'm going to flick back to here. When we are talking about the base of our argument and asking, hey, is this, is this solid enough to start our argument and to build up to reach our conclusion? Um, we're not going to be asking, hey, what other green boxes, what other supporting evidence can I put under here? Because that process of giving reasons to accept claims, I mean, that's what an argument is, right? But it's got to end sometime. You have to end that process of adding supports at, at some point. You have to reach points where you can say, okay, I'm done backing up the next thing higher up. I'm going to say this thing right here and, um, you know, it's late, I'm tired or something. And, and so this is the place where I'm going to stop and expect, hopefully be confident that anybody listening to my argument is coming into that argument thinking that the claim down here is not controversial and they're willing to accept this and then as we go up the argument towards what could be a very controversial conclusion that we're gradually ramping up the controversy we're coming from totally non-controversial and acceptable claims to more controversial and perhaps claims that the listener is not ready to accept on their own etc etc as you build your way up but these more controversial claims that are higher up are being supported hopefully relevantly by claims they already accept. So this is how we persuade people of things that they might initially find implausible or controversial or contradicting other beliefs that they have. We start 
at common ground, things that they are already familiar with and accept, and we work from those to stuff that's more unfamiliar, more controversial, all the way up. And if we've done a good job, then we will persuade people because they will be able to clearly see that we started somewhere reasonable and we followed kind of reasonable links, reasonable inferences, reasonable jumps from one claim to another so that they're going to have to say, hey, this ending point, which is unusual or something I didn't believe in beforehand, must also be reasonable because I started at a reasonable place and I followed reasonable paths. All right. So the very first thing we need to do is make sure we start somewhere reasonable. And to do that, at the tips of our arguments, we're not going to then generate more reasons to believe this thing, more reasons to believe this ending claim. What we're going to do to cap off lines of reasoning is ask about the source of that claim. And we're going to be prepared to say, okay, I accept this. This sounds reasonable because it comes from a reliable source. And in my next slides, I'm going to give you some examples of what kind of reliable sources are, right? Um, and hopefully they'll be familiar to you. You'll be like, oh, okay, you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about, right? So when we're evaluating the acceptability of a particular claim, first thing we want to do is identify where did that claim come from and is that source that I identified where this claim came from a reliable source, something I'm willing to trust? Okay, that's the key to A. It's kind of a two part thing. First, you have to identify where did the claim come from? Where's the source? And then evaluate the source. So don't evaluate the claim itself. Evaluate the source of the claim, where it came from. Okay, in rationale, so again, I'm just kind of describing it abstractly in rationale to give you prep for this but then when you actually do it there's going to be another video where we actually I have a screencast up here and we're actually doing the work and I'm dragging boxes around and showing you how to do it but in rationale you can see the left hand side usually we're using the advanced reasoning box the advanced reasoning panel that's where the green boxes are and the contention that the white boxes the contention boxes are that you used to build your listicle map And that is where you're going to see a whole, come on, stupid mouse button. Um, that's where you're going to see a whole bunch of different categories of bases, right? So different general uh, categories of sources of claims, right? So you can see that we've got um, common belief. We've got a by definition. So if the claim is just basically making a claim about what a word means. All bachelors are unmarried men, right? Okay, then the reason, the place that you get that from, you shouldn't have to supply a reason to back that up. It's pretty uncontroversial, right? And it's uncontroversial because it comes from a dictionary, right? It comes from just what the meanings of, what the meaning of bachelor is, right? So the source of the claim, all bachelors are unmarried men, is you know a definition right um, you could also talk about come hey everybody knows that you don't pump your own gas in New Jersey there's always a gas station attendant but in other states it's different right that might be an appeal to common belief at least people in New Jersey and the tri-state area know that in New Jersey you don't pump your own gas but if we ask somebody who'd lived their whole life in Arizona might not be common belief because why would they need to know the kind of the the gas pumping rules in New Jersey I have to say when I moved here I found that very unusual because I've lived in other places where it was perfectly normal that you there was self-serve stations and full serve stations and you would usually go to the self-serve ones because you knew how to pump your own gas and the gas was cheaper at the self-serve stations because you didn't have to pay for the gas station attendant around anyways so another example here right so if I had um, uh, um, a particular opinion, a medical opinion, right? That I, that part of my argument was involving some kind of medical stuff, right? And so I got one particular claim from Dr. Oz, right? Then I would categorize what Dr. Oz said, the claim that he made, probably under the expert opinion, because he is at least allegedly presenting himself as an expert on medical stuff, right? And so I 
you pick that category of expert opinion and then underneath double click in I type in his details I identify this particular expert that I am talking about and then the next thing I do is I'm going to actually evaluate whether or not in my opinion he counts as a reliable trustworthy expert so expert opinion is one of the most commonly used ones if you fool around in rationale you'll find that there's like a dozen different categories of basis boxes but like the ones that I've listed here are by far the most common ones that you're going to be using in my course and also I think just kind of in general assertions that just means that the person speaking the person making the argument just they said it they are the source right common belief means that the arguer said something but they said it with the intention that uh, it was totally uncontroversial because they're assuming that everybody already knows that thing and will will accept it um, example it means that uh, lots of times we will cite an example as support for a more general claim right so we'll talk about you know so maybe my argument I'm I'm in the business of thinking up silly examples here um, maybe my argument has something to do with um, gravity and so I have one claim that says everything that goes up must come down right and then underneath that I say you know uh, rocks that you throw up in the air fall down right okay how do I know that well that's an example right the source for that is an example I threw up rocks yesterday or something like that so I would hang a basis box underneath that green claim that everything that goes up must come down I would hang a basis box under that where I would identify my example I threw up rocks yesterday right and then I would evaluate that example and I'll tell you more about how we evaluate examples as reliable or unreliable expert opinions well there's reliable and trustworthy experts and then there are experts or at least alleged experts who are not reliable and trustworthy that you do not trust to be telling you knowledgeable things they they're they have fake credentials or they have conflicts of interests or something like that right another popular source for claims that start arguments is that you find them in the media or a publication right and by publication we mean broad there's also a, a website basis box too but they're all kind of interchangeable right we're talking about media in general and you would identify the particular media source time Newsweek CNN whatever it is and then you would evaluate how trustworthy and reliable you think that media source is okay another popular basis box is quotes quotations right so sometimes you will um, talk about is this happen quotes are popular in say literary analysis right you make some claim about what an author um, was doing and you back that up by citing a particular quote right or you make a claim about a particular fact of the world and you back that up with a quote from somebody so you would use the quotation uh, basis box so you find the category of basis that kind of fits the category the category of the source that your thing came from you slide that under right you say something about the identity of the specific identity of that source and whether or not you think they're good you have to articulate whether you think that that is a reliable kind of source right and then the last thing that you do is you summarize that text that you just typed in that box saying your kind of opinion your judgment about the reliability of the source with an overall evaluation um, that where you put either a check mark a question mark or an X that kind of expresses I think that this is an acceptable source therefore I'm gonna accept the green box that came from this source that that claim that's in the green box that came from this source or I'm not so sure about this one I'm a little bit skeptical I'd like to believe it I'm not so sure you're undecided about the quality of that source so you're not sure whether you should accept the claim in the green box or you give it an X if you are sure that the source is not trustworthy enough or is completely untrustworthy and unreliable such that you think that that source hearing that claim in the green box from that source doesn't mean that you should accept it right you should not accept that thing because it came from that quack doctor and they don't know what they're talking about or it came from that quack doctor 
who usually knows what they're talking about, but has massive conflicts of interest in that they are making money off of saying stupid things on TV that are against what the medical consensus is. I'm still taking shots at Dr. Oz because he is a terrible person. Even though he is a, a pretty good doctor at his specialty, like he's really good. He's at Columbia or something like that. And you know, so he operates on people. He's good at that stuff. But uh, when he shows up on TV and starts spewing opinions about stuff, that's when he's bad. He is not trustworthy in that context because he's not talking about things that he's truly an expert on. And or if even if he is, he has massive conflicts of interest because he's earning money off of saying the things that he said. So that's why he's saying those things, not because they're medically well-founded. Uh, I have lots of examples for that. So come at me, bro, if you like, if you like Dr. Oz, that's on you. Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit more in general about what goes into basis boxes. The very first thing you really, you do have to be specific about where the claim came from, right? So you have to pick the category of basis box but then you have to be specific about the actual place it came from, all right? And it's not sufficient to say, well, the claim came from the article that I read. So for instance, in the listicle, when you're trying to A, evaluate your listicle, you are not going to say that the source for all of those claims is the listicle that you just read. Uh -uh. You need to find out where the author of the listicle got their information, got those claims, okay? So you have to go back one more step okay and even if they kind of cite a particular place where they got it and that particular place is on the internet somewhere and it has a URL please don't copy paste the URL into rationale and the simple reason for that is URLs tend to be really long and uh, they don't word wrap they don't loop around right and that means that when you paste URLs into a rationale map it makes them just super wide like unmanageably wide so don't do URLs so for instance if the source was an article on um, the New York Times then instead of putting the full URL of where that thing is put the New York Times article from February 13th or something like that we don't need to be super we don't need to be that specific that the map itself has to has to have the URL that we can navigate to. We just need to know enough to evaluate the source. And knowing that it came from the New York Times will be enough. We don't need the exact URL, okay? And then the second thing that needs to go in the basis box is in the typing there. The first thing is to identify the source fairly specifically. And then the second thing is that evaluation of that source's reliability and trustworthiness, okay? And you need to focus on primarily not just yourself, but the intended audience of that argument. Because some sources are gonna be trustworthy for some audiences, but some sources are gonna be yelled at as fake news by other audiences. So you gotta keep that in mind, right? Because we tailor arguments for particular audiences. All right, so th those are the do's. That's what does belong in basis boxes. What doesn't, more reasons. Okay, so I see this a lot. So I'm going to warn you now, you're probably going to forget. And for about half of you, when you get your first opportunity to evaluate your listicle, about half of you are going to not be able to resist supplying extra reasons to back up the claims that are made in the listicle. And you're going to put green reasons in blue basis boxes. Please try not to do that. Okay. The blue basis boxes aren't for you to actually provide extra support. They're also not for you to explain what the green box means in more detail, right? You're not supposed to give more detail about what the, what the claim in the green box is saying. Not at all. You're supposed to be telling me where it came from and whether the place where it came from is a good place, a reliable and trustworthy place, okay? And the other thing is, just like the URLs, if you know, it came from a particular place. I don't want properly formatted citations as the, as the place where it came from. Identify where it came from more briefly than a properly formatted citation or a complete URL. All right. And so 
here's more detail you might want to scrub past this and see it later or something like that but this is where I'm going to spend some time talking about those most popular categories and give you more detail about how for each particular one you ought to be thinking about okay what do I have to do to evaluate the acceptability of this category of source so for instance if we're talking about an assertion right that we place this basis box under something that the author or the arguer said that we think the true source is just the arguer the person presenting the argument so the question you need to ask and answer in here right so first you need to identify the author and any real relevant details about the author to kind of identify them and then you need to answer this question. Why are they to be trusted or relied upon as a reliable source? And you could come out either way on this, right? So you could say, yeah, I'm prepared to trust this person, right? They seem to be knowledgeable. They're confident about this. That's good enough for me, right? That could be a potential evaluation that you write in your basis box, right? Or you could say, I have, this is, this person's random. I don't know who they are. So some stranger just walks up to me on the street and says what they said. And I'm going to shrug my shoulders and not really believe them. So I don't think that's an acceptable claim. That would be another, in lots of circumstances, very acceptable and appropriate evaluation of the acceptability of an assertion that an arguer makes. Okay. Sec another common thing is common belief, right? So lots of claims that people make, they make them, they don't really come from the arguer. Right? That's not really the source. The arguer makes those starting claims, thinks they're going to be uncontroversial and acceptable because they're presuming that everybody hearing their argument already believes that thing that they just said for a variety of other reasons. Right? So, for example, right, New in New Jersey, nobody pumps their own gas. Right? That is a common belief for people in New Jersey. Right? So you have to identify the audience. You have to make sure that the audience that you're talking about, who commonly believes it, is in fact the same audience that's reading that argument, right? So for example, you're on the internet, you're reading a listicle, and it makes this claim that New Jersey, nobody pumps their own gas, right? You might think, oh, well, that's acceptable. Everybody knows that. But you have to think about the audience, the reach, of that listicle, of that argument, of that claim on the internet. The internet is not just for New Jerseyans, right? The internet is for everybody. So if that website isn't like New Jersey specific, such that it's really gonna tend only to attract people from New Jersey as readers, then you have to ask, look, are other people from India, from um, South Africa, from Belgium, from Arizona, are they gonna know that New Jersey has you know, a law that says every gas station has to be full serve? No, they're not. They don't have any particular reason to know that. So something that you might know quite well, and for New Jerseyans is totally a common belief, might not be acceptable in an argument on the internet because the audience there can be people who are totally unfamiliar and do not commonly believe that claim. All right, another thing is examples. So first off, you make a general claim Right in the argument, maybe there's a general claim, and it's backed up uh, by reference to an example. Right, so make some claim about the justice system. Say, it's good, bad, it's unjust for these kind of people, something like that. And in the argument that somebody presents, they cite a particular example. They talk about George Floyd, or they talk about some other crime. They talk about Charles Manson, or they talk about O.J. Simpson, or something like that right? Uh, Epstein, who knows, right? So that is an example that's used. It's a specific example that's being used to justify the acceptability of a general statement about the justice system, right? What you need to do then is identify the example, quickly, briefly identify the example, right? So don't paste a whole paragraph describing or presenting the example, right? But the important question that you have to answer is, look, is that example actually a good representative example of the general thing that the, uh, that the claim makes? Or is it a fluke or an outlier? 
and that's your judgment. Is this thing a representative example that they pointed to, or is it some really weird special case? And so it's not a good and reliable source as backup as the source for that claim in the green box. All right, well, I already kind of covered this one when I talked about Dr. Oz, right? Lots of times claims get presented in papers and either the arguer presents themselves as an expert or the arguer points to a claim that they made and say, and say so and Dr. So-and-so or expert so-and-so said this thing with the intention that you will accept it because an expert said it, right? And hey, if an expert really said that thing, that's a good reason to accept that claim. What we need to do to evaluate those kind of claims is ask ourselves, hey, are they a real legitimate expert in the area of the claim, right? And how do you know? What kind of qualifications or credentials do you know that kind of um, back up this claim to be a real expert? And even if they are a real expert, is this a context where you have to legitimately worry that they have a conflict of interest? So let's say we're talking about some claim about the climate and somebody who is a climatologist, somebody who's a professor at a university, a professor of climatology at a university says it. Okay, those are pretty fair credentials for most people, right? But let's say you also know that that person gets the bulk of their funding from the petrochemical industry. Well, they are a qualified expert, but the fact that they get funded by the petrochemical industry might be enough reason for you to say, I'm not ready to trust this expert. They're knowledgeable, but they might have motivations to be saying what they're saying that don't come from their expertise, but instead come from their bank account, for example, right? All right, media and publications. Again, I think I mentioned this, but I'll just kind of reiterate and say it a little bit more specifically. You do have to kind of specify the organization or the publication itself. You don't have to specify the web page, right? But talk about the organization. If it's a freelance reporter, then maybe they're an expert instead, or maybe you want to treat them as a media organization, kind of an individual person with a track record, right? So there's lots of freelance reporters that, you know, uh, work for many organizations. They work on their own, investigate something, and then they shop a story around or, or something like that. So you can evaluate the place that they sold it to because, of course, reputable media organizations generally have editors and fact checkers and things like that. And so that's those are the things you're going to ask yourself, right? Is this a trusted media organization by myself or even more importantly, by the audience for this argument, right? Is it an unknown or unusual media organization, right? Is it just some rando on YouTube who has named their channel with news in it or what, right? Is it evident that they have bias or an agenda? Do you know their funding? Are they, you know, a public service nonprofit or are they profit focused and clickbaity? Or are they wholly owned by some mysterious billionaire who has some agenda? These are the kinds of questions you need to ask to conclude whether or not that media source is trustworthy for you, for your audience, all right? And then with the quotations, right? Sometimes we have reasons in our claims in our argument that are backed up by specific quotations, right? So especially for literary analysis, right? I might have a, a claim in my argument saying that this author likes to use color, um, you know, reds to denote anger and blues to denote sadness or something like that. And I'm going to use as a source for that general claim a couple quotes. Quotes are like examples, but they're like textual examples, right? So I'm going to point to, oh, they used red here to express anger and they used blue here to express the, the grief that someone had over losing someone or something like that, right? And so you should cite just really briefly the source. Don't actually put the quote in here because that can be really lengthy and we don't need it for the map, right? Um, so it's more like a reminder when you actually write the essay that you know where to go look for it and that it's a legitimate quote and that it wasn't made up, right? Because there are fictional quotes flying around the internet too, right? So we have to evaluate, hey, did, 
did that person actually say that thing? Can I track down where they actually sit, said it when I see that quote on the internet? Is it really them? Right? So we have to evaluate that. Um, more examples here. So you're probably sick of them. I'm already at 40 minutes on this video. Um, but uh, these are examples you can freeze frame and take a look at, at these. I just wanted to provide kind of a lot of examples here to give you some familiarity for the kinds of things that I'm expecting to see you write when you hang basis boxes under green boxes. Okay, so here I'm just going to pick one at random from each one of these slides, but you can freeze frame and hopefully all of these are legible for you if you full screen them. Right. Um, the claim is some assignments are confusing, presumably for a particular course, right? And then as a source for this, not as a reason, but as a source that makes this claim acceptable, you provide an example. You say, hey, I'm pointing at the Blackbeard assignment here. There are a ton of typos in it. Okay. So then the arguer is pointing to a particular assignment and saying that has typos in it as the source not a reason for this, but as a source for this, and then you identify that as the source, next thing you have to do is evaluate that. Either check it, right, to see that it actually exists, that there is a Blackbeard assignment that does have typos in it, but maybe more importantly is, hey, is that particular kind of defect, that example that they brought, is that an example of this thing? Or is like, like, because a criticism of this might be, that's the only, that was the only assignment in the whole course that was confusing at all. And the typos were really minor. This is a crappy example, right? Or you could say, actually, no, this is a representative example. That is, they could have picked any of a half a dozen assignments as their example. They happened to pick this one, but there's lots of them out there. That means this isn't anything special or unusual. It's just one of many examples they could have used, right? And that would get a check mark okay but it all depends right and you want to have that so in here in this example I put the question mark there right I would expect that what you write in here in articulating your judgment of how acceptable the claim is that needs to line up with the overall assessment of the check mark the question mark or the X okay and as long as those two things line up and I'm happy with the detail that you have articulated down here then you and I can differ with whether we think that this is acceptable I just need to see enough detail here to understand why you think this is an acceptable claim or not or are unsure about it you don't have to I don't have to agree with you about this evaluation because it's your evaluation. I might have a different one, but the point of all this stuff is not to come up with the right answer. The point of this is to come up with your answer and make it clear so that if we have a disagreement about this argument and whether it's persuasive or not, things doing things like this help us figure out and pinpoint the areas of disagreement we have, hopefully so that we can resolve them, right? So if I have a difference of judgment, with you over whether or not this is an acceptable uh, claim to start an argument, then instead of disputing all sorts of other stuff, we can just focus on this, right? And if I don't like this example, but you do, right? Then to resolve our differences, I can either tell you, look, this is the only example you can point to that, that, that does this thing. I don't think it's unfair to say this if this is the only thing you can point to. Or you could possibly say, you know, I think this is enough of an example. You only need one. To make this true right or you could say this isn't a special example there's this there's this there's this there's this he just picked that one example and that's getting us to discuss as people who might be on different sides of an argument to discuss actual constructive parts of an argument that we disagree with that's going to have much higher chances of getting us to come to some kind of consensus or mutual understanding than if we just kind of argue over the conclusion of an argument or just argue vaguely and talk past each other and stuff like that. So to sum up from this very long diatribe on acceptability, for each end or tip of your map, you need to first kind of determine what 
category of source does my claim from? I need to pick an appropriate category basis box, right? And then I need to identify more specifically the source in the actual box, type it out in words. Then I need to articulate the trustworthiness or the reliability of that source in words. And then I need to sum up that judgment that I made up there with that overall X check mark or question mark. Okay, and again, a reminder, there's not gonna be, even for the simple listicles, no single right answer, but there are gonna be plenty of wrong ones. Okay, um, so hopefully this lecture and the A quiz that follows this are gonna help give you some kind of a tentative feel for what this means. And then after you've done all three quizzes, you've done the A lecture now, you've completed this, you're gonna do the A quiz, quiz number three, which you can redo an unlimited amount of time. So don't stress about it, take it, see how you do, retake it, keep retaking it until you're happy, until it opens up the next stage, which is the R video. You learn a little bit about R, you take an R quiz, then you learn a little bit about G, you take a G quiz, and each one of those, this is you can work this stuff through at your own pace, and I'm hoping that these things, watching these videos and doing these quizzes, are not obstacles for you, but this is the scaffolding kind of stuff that I talked about in learning theory, right? I'm trying to get you a little bit familiar with doing ARG, with seeing ARG happen, right? Such that you're better prepared to succeed when you have an open-ended question of your listicle map and I say, okay, go do it on that, right? So all of these other things that I'm asking you to do, watch these videos and do these quizzes before you do your own listicle, before you evaluate your own listicle, are there to try and help you succeed quicker uh, when you actually get to that listicle. All right, so don't view these things as obstacles. If after watching this, you go take the quiz and you can't quite pass it, and you can't quite pass it, and you keep trying, and, and if it takes you more than three tries to get past that quiz, to score well enough to get past that quiz, you should reach out to me because there's, there's probably something you're missing, something I didn't get across well enough in this lecture, right? Something you're not understanding about what acceptability is and how it works, and talking to me is gonna be the most efficient way for me to figure out exactly what it is that's not clicking for you yet so that I can fix that and so that you can go on and, and, and pass that quiz and go on to the next thing, okay? So do not, I mean, you can grind out every one of these quizzes. Basically, randomly check off because they're all just, you know, multiple choice or they're all true falses, right? So you can just randomly click answers and as long as you grind away at it, you'll pass all these quizzes, but you won't have learned anything. Uh, and that will slow you up later on, like quickly, later, soon, later on. So take the quizzes seriously, but not too seriously. And if you have trouble passing them, reach out to me. Okay.